Daddy Vines. Land. Rear left, rear left. As a chaplain in the military, I try to stay creative and to simply nurture them, to inspire them, to kind of inflate them with good stuff. A lot of the members of the unit here view our chaplain as some super stud or something. Like, this guy is like breaking records and run times here doing PT, you know. A lot of our best guys try to not necessarily challenge them, but they'll go out on a run together and, and Chad Wilbur just zooms ahead of them, like, all the time. Thank you for your service. Thanks, no sir. Thank Our you. chaplain did break a record. Went to air assault school and there's a 12 mile road march. You must complete a 12 mile road march in three hours or less, uh, carrying 35 pounds. And Chaplain Willenberg um, completed that time in an hour and 42 minutes. And the last record that was held, I think it was held for like 10 years by one individual, was about, I think an hour and 49 minutes. So it wasn't just by mere seconds or minutes. This guy broke it by like six, seven minutes, something like that. So that was a pretty big deal. Come on. It makes everyone feel extremely proud, and, and again, not, not just because he's the chaplain, but somebody that can, that can go that far and, and be that fast and do that well and win these, these honors and these awards and things, that's, that's fantastic. Anyone that can be associated with somebody like that as a member of their unit, it definitely fills them with pride. If my soldiers get inspired by it, that's great. I think that part of my job is nurturing the living providing that inspiration. If I can be the source of that inspiration, I'm all for it. But um, it's not me in the end. Yeah, I think God blessed me with good health and certain abilities. Therefore, like to Him, is glory. But if my soldiers get inspired by it, that, that, that's wonderful. He's also extremely fit. There's not many people in this battalion that can keep up with Father Willenberg on a run or, or at any PT event, really. It's his passion, you know. He really loves and enjoys, you know, working out, especially when it comes to endurance races or marathons or anything like that sort. Definitely helps to be fit when you're a chaplain. Uh, somehow um, being able to keep up with your soldiers or, or maybe challenge them from time to time uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to physical abilities somehow opens the doors for ministry. I can recall so many situations when uh, during our PT session, uh, I have a soldier coming up to me and starting a conversation about simple PT stuff that would turn into something greater. They will open up and the conversation will go completely off topic, away from physical training, will go to something that they actually want to talk about to the chaplain. Because they don't need me as another officer. They don't need me as, as a drill sergeant. They don't need me as somebody who will sometimes you know, push them to their limits, but they definitely need me as a chaplain. Um, that's how I see my role. And if, they, if I can inspire them in any way by my physical attributes, abilities, that's, that's wonderful. But I simply use that gift um, as a as a way to minister to them on numerous occasions. So they're keeping us safe. So I invite you now to pray with me uh, in your own faith tradition. Let us pray. The chaplain goes through what what we go through when we go to combat. The chaplain goes to combat. When we jump out of airplanes, the chaplain jumps out of airplanes. When we sleep in the mud for a week, so does the chaplain. So anything that's bothering a soldier, it's very easy for them to come and talk to the chaplain about. By simply being there, you can prove to them that I care, that I'm here for you, no matter what. Military chaplains have had a presence in the armed forces of the United States since the American Revolution. In order to serve as chaplains in today's Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard, Catholic priests must be trained specifically for that duty. 
So the first four weeks of, of their course are basically basic training. So we give them an experience in the first four weeks of the course of what it's like to be a young basic trainee anywhere else here in the, in the Army or here on Fort Jackson. So we give them a little bit of flavor of that. And, and the real focus on those first four weeks is on what we call warrior tasks and battle drills. We're teaching them how to be soldiers. We begin the soldierization process with them uh, and turning them from civilian clergy into Army chaplains. It's been difficult. I am the oldest priest in a class of 70 um, by seven years. I think the next person is uh, like 46 or 47. Physically, it's been very demanding. I think the hardest part for me is that I have no military background. Just the acronyms alone are hard to assimilate. Uh, it's been very challenging. Was it difficult? We teach them how to communicate in the Army writing style, how to write an Army memorandum, uh, how to use the language of the Army to accomplish ministry. And that's really what it's about. We learn a lot in these three months. Uh, really, this school uh, prepares us uh, really well. So I think that this is very important because to be a good chaplain, that's why we have uniforms. We need to be a good soldiers as well, yeah. Uh, what we try to impress upon them is there is an identity that is distinctive of the chaplain. And that identity is really summarized in you need to go where it sucks the most. Uh, if you're not where it sucks the most, you're probably in the wrong place. Uh, and so we really try to impress upon them that you need to be where your soldiers are. What I tell them is your sheep need to be able to recognize your walk in the dark. It's a song without Catholics make up about one-fourth of the five branches of the military. We make up only 8% of the chaplain corps. So there is a tremendous gap between the need for Catholic priests and their presence, their actual presence in the military. It is tough for the military and we could certainly use more. That means that there is a continued need for chaplains to be serving. When you're a military chaplain, you are going to be dealing with some unique challenges that families in a civilian parish are not dealing with. There's a cliche out there that, you know, the military didn't issue you a family. Uh, now, it is challenging because you're a servant to your country and you're a servant to your family and you have to balance those two things together. So I think that just taking care of a family while you're going about all the things that you do in the military, whether that's moving, the long hours, the deployments, etc. That's what makes it challenging. 13 moves in 24 years, almost 24 years. That, that's a lot of moves. Picking up and moving from my house is not hard. Picking up and leaving friends never gets easy. Um, we say goodbye to a lot of people. Like many military families, the Seacrests have endured long separations during deployments. We'll be married 24 years in October. He has been to Iraq and to Korea and other tours or things. And so in 24 years, he's been gone almost five. And then there's, you know, always going to be issues with essentially a single parent uh, raising kids. Even though they're not a single parent, they might as well be when, when their, their spouse is out in the field. But there's a lot of help out there with the military. You know, there are your friends. Um, the church is what I always fell to or would go to. The church has helped in living with my family. It's, it's always been the, um, the constant. It's the normalcy of the crazy life that we tend to lead in the military. It's just normal to me. It's home to me. A return from a military deployment is frequently a homecoming with mixed emotions. 
and you come home and that first day is sort of like that. Oh, it's just so awesome, you know, just hugging them and, and everything, talking, seeing them in person, and it's great. What happens is, is over the course of that year, folks have been doing things, your wife, um, a lot of things that, that you used to do that you had agreed upon she was going to take care of while you're going. You come home and you want to start helping and you start, you know, integrating back in. Well, it doesn't actually work like that. Because now they're they're uncomfortable because you're kind of getting in their way with stuff. It's not to hurt him or belittle him, but it's much easier to do it myself than to sit and explain it and make a list. And so there's always communication issues, I think. And so, you know, the Chaplain Corps here, we do a lot of programs just to help couples learn to communicate better and to help families communicate better. Jennifer, secrets. Yeah. So I've learned to take the time and make the list and explain it to him because he appreciates it a lot better to be a part of the family instead of watching the family. My job as chaplain is still to be with them, to listen to them. Sometimes it's as a counselor. Sometimes it's as uh, just a shoulder they can cry on. Sometimes it's someone to whom they can turn when they don't know where to go. And, and I might have to be the third party perspective just to listen unbiasedly and to then maybe make recommendations of talk to this agency or that agency. You know, we have over a hundred helping agencies in the United States Air Force that are designed to keep our airmen and our families fit. We just simply wouldn't be the same in a bad way. We would not be the same had we not had that support that the church gives us. I would say that being a chaplain is very much so in line with what our Holy Father Pope Francis is talking about, getting out and smelling like your sheep. The chaplain corps has been pushing its chaplains to get out of their offices and to, to go out and to be in and among their troops, their airmen, their soldiers. And so when Pope Francis starts talking that way, you know, we were joking whether or not he got that from us or we got that from him. That's probably a very good analogy that, that military chaplains do respond to Francis' call to smell like the sheep because an effective chaplain is going to be where his soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, or coasties are. He's going to be with them. Sometimes during the rock march, sometimes during PT or after PT, sometimes waiting on the harness shed as we waiting to jump or waiting on the drop zone to, for the buses to pick us up. And there will be situations when I'm approached by uh, the paratrooper or soldier saying, Chaplain, I would like to talk. And those, most of the time, are quite powerful conversations. And it's truly humbling to be an instrument in God's hands in those conversations and provide different outlook provide motivation, provide maybe not a solution, but pointing them into the right direction when it comes to making life-changing decisions on different issues. You know, as a parish priest, you know your parishioners, but you know, you're not sleeping in the same tent with them. You're not sharing the same risks as them. Whereas in the Army, you know, you get to know them uh, even before the deployment begins. Uh, and so I think in that way it is very different because you have a shared experience. And I would say that shared experience is amplified when combat is involved. The U.S. Army Chaplain Corps Museum is a military history museum and we tell the history of the United States Army Chaplain Corps to include chaplains and chaplain assistants. Uh, we began with, of course, Martin of Tours where we get the origin of the word chaplain. Uh, of course, the Revolutionary War and it's laid out by major military conflicts, Revolutionary War, Civil War, World War I, and it all goes all the way to current, to modern times.
The early beginnings of the Chaplain Corps during the Revolutionary War, of course, was predominantly a Protestant Corps. There was one Catholic chaplain who served. He was French-Canadian. When Benedict Arnold invaded Canada, he joined their cause and came back to America with them. And he was well over 60 years of age and served most of the war. So he's known as our first Catholic chaplain. The first Catholics to be commissioned would be in the 1850s. The hospital exhibit in our World War I section shows a chaplain ministering to a wounded soldier. Not only does it show the chaplain caring for that soldier, but it also displays that a chaplain will minister to all soldiers, regardless of denomination. He may or may not know the denomination of the soldier he's ministering to, but it doesn't matter. They're there to help all soldiers spiritually. Some of our more highly honored chaplains, uh, such as our Medal of Honor recipients, we actually had three that were Roman Catholic priests. Our latest to be honored with Medal of Honor was a uh, Korean War era chaplain, Chaplain Nino Capon. Uh, well, he found himself in a battle situation and he stayed with the wounded. He didn't leave them and he was captured. In a POW camp, he tried to help other soldiers there that he thought were worse off than himself. Uh, he virtually starved himself to death. Uh, he's been declared a servant of God. His paperwork is at the Vatican now for review. So he, along with a Navy chaplain, Vincent Capadano, uh, are our two military chaplains that are up for sainthood. There are several stories throughout the museum that show the compassion and the willingness of chaplains to stay with their soldiers. They nurture the living, care for the wounded, and they honor the dead. I remember when the first time I um, told my bishop about the call I feel in my heart to become a chaplain and eventually asking him to be released from the diocese for a couple of years. Um, I met a little bit of uh, hesitation on his side. I didn't respond to it right away. We do have a, a pre-shortage for sure. My primary responsibility as a bishop, of course, is to my own diocese, my own diocesan church. Bishops need priests to run the parishes, to, to work in all different assignments within the diocese. I wanted him to think about it, and I wanted to think about it myself. So we took several months to think about it before he asked me the second time. And that was the, the point at which uh, we got more serious in consideration, because it is, uh, first of all, a big step for him. You know, he's come here from Poland, but for him to go into the military service would be another big change for him. So it was a, a significant step for him, one that would involve his commitment for a good number of years but also, again, a very significant sacrifice for our own diocesan church to lose the availability, the ministry of a fine young priest like Father Luke. When a priest leaves the diocese, everyone feels the impact. Um, beginning with the local parish that that young man was a part of, um, people um, really get attached to their priest. He doesn't feel like a priest. It feels like you're talking to a friend, which I think makes it a lot easier. And he is really good at tying your faith into it without kind of feeling like, oh, I'm talking to a priest. Like I don't, like he feels like just a normal guy. When a man leaves to go into extraordinary ministry, it's felt first at the parish level, it's also felt at the diocesan level. It's felt among the presbyterate, the brother priests that he has. Everyone feels it in a particular way. In the last seven years, we've had 45 priests retire from active ministry. At the same time, we've lost eight other priests for various reasons, through death or illness or leave of absence and so forth. In that same time, we've lost those 53 priests. We've only had 15 ordained. So we've had a net loss of 38 priests in the last seven years in our diocesan church. 
And that will continue to be a challenge going forward because we have so many priests who are reaching the retirement age or experiencing poor health after the age of, of 70. So every year we will have perhaps three or four or five priests retiring, but only one or two or maybe three priests ordained. You know, there are people from Rhode Island who are in the military. And so the idea of, I think, a, a bishop giving up someone to the military ordinary is, you know, just a kind of recognizing that he wants to be of service to his people as those people go on and move on into service-related positions, you know, all over the world. But that's a challenge I think a bishop often has to face, trying to balance the needs of the local diocesan church while also recognizing the fact that we are always part of something larger and we have some obligations to the universal church as well, whether it's in military service or uh, releasing a priest to serve in a seminary community somewhere or to do some missionary work. But that's a tough decision sometimes and um, something we have to think about and pray about very carefully. It took some prayer and some convincing to actually um, convince him to the point when he said, yes, you can start pursuing that call. I know that you are serious about it and I believe that's where God wants you to be at this part of your life. There is no question that the priest, wearing the military uniform, an officer's uniform no less, and that position carries with it a conflict of interest. The military chaplaincy is a major spiritual and moral problem in the church. The big untruth of Christianity, Catholicism, Orthodoxy, Protestantism, Evangelicals, and that untruth is that one can move logically from the teaching of Jesus to participating in the activities of war, killing, maiming, murder, deceit, etc. It can't be done. There is no logical way for moving from the teachings of Jesus to what the church is called the just war theory. How can a Catholic priest serve in an institution like the military that sanctions war and killing? I don't think they should be serving in the military. I don't think they should be uh, getting a paycheck from the military. We do understand that while God would never desire a war to be fought, sometimes what is good, what is true, what is beautiful requires us to defend it. And for the men and women who have decided to make that sacrifice, very often they're the ones that are in most need of pastoral care because they've had to make hard decisions that require them to defend what's true and good and beautiful. So the chaplain's there to always be there for their soul, for their spirit, and to provide the care and comfort that they very often need. I'm all in favor of giving people the sacraments under any circumstance, but you also have to say that you cannot kill another member of the body of Christ. You can't do it. It is in this place where chaplains are most needed. In the midst of violence and war and chaos, there is one person in the unit, one person in the organization uh, who represents God's peace. I think that's why it's so important. I think the other reason is that chaplains can help in, that, in those situations serve as a, as a moral barometer of sorts. And so it's necessary for chaplains to serve in the armed forces precisely because of that. Our commanders do need that guidance. Our soldiers do need that moral guidance. If they weren't part of the structure, they would have no access to the commanders at all. They wouldn't even be able to raise a moral question because they'd have no contact. Uh, the fact that priests are embedded in the military allows them to make a difference at the highest level. My primary vocation, even before being ordained, has been to call the churches back to following what is there in the gospel, Jesus' teachings of nonviolent love of friends and enemies. The church exists to save souls. The last canon of canon law reads, the supreme law of the church is the salvation of souls. Nothing is more important than that. 
What is being communicated by the larger church, which its use of a just war theory, not dogma, and by the military chaplaincy is that going out, putting a bayonet in someone's kidney, slitting someone's throat, burning someone's face off with a flamethrower is the way to be saved, is the way to eternal salvation. That is an outright lie. That is utterly logically inconsistent with anything Jesus ever taught or could have taught. Therefore, the military chaplaincy from that perspective is a major, major problem, the only solution of which is to eliminate it. I don't think that means that we abdicate the responsibility of leaving good Catholics with no recourse, with no opportunity to celebrate the sacraments, with no one encouraging them to lead a moral life and to examine their actions. If we pull out from all contact with the military, I think we're a little bit like Pontius Pilate who washes his hands in the face of evil. I am probably the envy of all of the civilian priests of our nation to have 700 young men ages 18 to their mid to late 20s at Mass every week. Tremendous opportunity to spread the good news, the message of the Gospel to these young men. Almighty, ever-living God, who restore us to eternal life in the resurrection of Christ. Here is a unique situation because these young men want to get away from these drill instructors at every point that they can. And Sunday services is one of those times, the only times, that they are not in view of those drill instructors. There's a great parallel which goes on here during this training between these men who turn into men. I believe all of the priests are praying that they turn into Catholic men. At some point in all of our lives, we start to relate to God as adults rather than children. I hope that that happens here in large part. Christ the Lord is risen on high, now he lives.